Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. Thank you so much to everybody for joining today for the first of my kitten care webinar series. I want to thank Royal Canin for sponsoring this webinar series and making it possible to bring you four weeks of kitten care education. I want you to know that next Saturday I will be doing a webinar at the same time and that will be available uh, here on YouTube and also uh, on the Facebook pages for Kitten Lady and Royal Canin. It will be April 25th, a webinar on the topic of growing kittens uh, who are getting ready for adoption, weaning. Uh, I'll also have a webinar on May 2nd, which is about keeping kittens healthy and caring for the most fragile felines. And then on May 9th, I will be doing my fourth webinar, which is all about uh, feral felines, taking care of hissy spitty kittens, uh, and what to do when you encounter a kitten outside. So if you are registered at kittenlady.org slash webinar, you're going to get a follow-up email with supplemental materials and some additional resources. So please make sure you go on there and register if you're interested in that. Finally, I want to say if you are having some questions that you'd like to ask during this webinar, you're welcome to type those into the chat wherever you're watching this. Uh, we will be collecting questions throughout the webinar and I'll be taking them at the end. So Put your questions in the chat anytime you have them. I'll be answering some at the end. I do ask that questions stay on the topic of this webinar, which is bottle babies, and I'll be answering as many as I can. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hannah Shaw, and I run a project called Kitten Lady. It's a humane education and advocacy project focused on the smallest and most vulnerable felines, neonatal kittens, uh, little ones like the ones you see here in this picture. I'm also the author of a book called Tiny But Mighty, Kitten Lady's Guide to Saving the Most Vulnerable Felines. And that is a book of more than 300 pages of kitten care information that's relevant for foster parents, anybody who is uh, caring for young kittens. And then for children, uh, I have a book for them as well. It's called Kitten Lady's Big Book of Little Kittens. And that is a really fun uh, picture book to introduce children to foster care for kittens and what kitten rescue is all about. And finally, I am the founder of Orphan Kitten Club. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization with some uh, various programs throughout San Diego and throughout the country. Uh, we have nursery programs, sterilization programs, and we also have our Mighty Cat program, which is the first grant program in the world specifically funding care of neonatal kittens. Uh, so I'm very proud of the work that we do. So today I am going to be telling you everything I know about the smallest and most vulnerable felines, little ones like Soba here who fit in the palm of your hand, who at first look might seem very you know, frail and fragile and uh, defenseless and so tiny, but they are packed with so much potential to become a mighty, mighty cat. And uh, here's Soba all grown up. And this is really my joy in life is helping kittens make this transformation. So um, I've been doing this for more than a decade. I'm gonna be sharing with you what I know. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this subject with all of you, especially right now because we are entering kitten season. Kitten season is the time of year where there are a lot of cats being born um, on the streets and in homes of people who have not sterilized their cats. Um, you know, this is the time of year when uh, shelters are seeing more kittens come in than any other time. And uh, these kittens are entering shelters in boxes and buckets and uh, the shelters really need our support to have somewhere for them to go. A lot of people don't realize that these young kittens are actually the most vulnerable felines in an animal shelter. So that might surprise you. Why are these kittens so vulnerable? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. The first is that kittens are, cats are an altricial species. So they are born blind, deaf, their eyes are closed, their ears are folded, they're defenseless, they can't regulate their own body temperature, they're entirely dependent on their moms uh, for everything from warmth to nutrition to safety. 
They also have underdeveloped immune systems, which means that they are more susceptible to illness, especially in a high volume setting like in an animal shelter or outside um, in a cat colony. And many of them, unfortunately, do become separated from their moms, either because they truly do become separated from mom, um, something happens to mom, or more commonly because people scoop them up outside, they find these kittens outdoors, and don't realize mom is right around the corner. So a lot of these kittens end up uh, entering our shelter system in the United States. And uh, you know, you might ask, well, can't the shelter just take care of them? And the truth is that you know most shelters in the United States are not set up to care for little kittens like the one you see in this picture. Most shelters don't have 24-hour care facilities where they can take care of neonatal kittens around the clock. That means that you know the same day that that kitten comes into the shelter, we really want to be able to get them right back out into a foster home. Kittens can also be exposed to contagions in shelters that can be fatal for them. Like I said, you know, they're very susceptible to illness. So they really do best when they are in a home environment, somewhere that they can be safe and quarantined. Uh, I know we all know about that right now. Uh, a shelter is also really an ideal place for an animal who is adoptable, so an animal who's looking for their forever home. We all know that you know when you're looking for a new companion, you can go to your local shelter and find an adoptable animal. But these little ones are not adoptable because they are too young to be adopted. So uh, that's why we really need kittens to be in foster care uh, until they are adoption age. It's important to know that you know most animal shelters don't have uh, the ability to care for these little kittens around the clock. There are more than 3,500 animal shelters uh, with facilities in the United States, but only about a dozen of them have 24-hour care facilities for neonatal kittens. Um, so that tells you, you know, the importance that if these kittens come into your local shelter, really they're they're relying on having a list of names of people like me and you who step in and save their lives. And all of this is to say that saving lives really is a community effort. This is a community-based issue, and so the solution is community-based as well. We know that when we open our homes, we exponentially uh, grow the impact of an animal shelter. The animal shelter has limited square footage, limited staffing, limited capacity, but when we open our homes, that shelter doesn't just become a building, it becomes a whole community. I'm part of it, you're part of it, all of us are part of it together. Um, so this is really a community effort. Now, I know that a lot of us are staying at home right now due to the coronavirus pandemic, and uh, you might be interested in some of the ways that that's impacting animals. It certainly is having a big impact on kittens. Uh, the bad news is that shelters are operating with limited staffing right now and that's because you know they can't have volunteers in the same capacity they typically can um, they're you know cutting back on some uh, staff in some areas because of course we want to keep our shelter staff safe as well they're also having to do social distancing while keeping the shelter going as much as possible um, but even uh, spay neuter is on hold in many parts of the country right now and so we anticipate that there's going to be a high number of kittens being born this year so more kittens being born but less uh, capacity on site at the shelter means now is really the most important moment you know, in recent history to sign up to foster. Now, the good news is we're all staying at home, right? So this is a great time for you to start your fostering journey. And I know a lot of people uh, have signed up to foster recently. That was actually why we wanted to do this webinar series uh, was to really give support to all of the wonderful, generous people who have opened their homes during this time to foster kittens. Um, there's never been a better time to start, so if you are one of those foster homes, I wanna say thank you for signing up, and I hope that these next four weeks are very educational for you and help you with your journey. I wanna mention there are lots of different populations you can foster, so we are talking about orphaned kitten care today because that is, um, a thing that people often struggle with. Uh, but I want to say you can also foster moms and babies. Moms and babies are a wonderful population to foster. There's a great need for that. 
Um, and taking care of a mom and babies is so joyful. I always fall in love with the mom. Um, and you'll learn a lot of things that are relevant to caring for a mom with babies today. But the nice thing about having a mom is, uh, you know, you care for the mom and the mom cares for the babies. And you sort of just are playing a supervisory role. So you're just making sure that the kittens really are gaining weight. The kittens are, you know, doing well. Uh, but mom does a lot of the work for you. So that's a really nice place to start. If you're um, interested in starting out, why don't you sign up for mom and babies? You can also start with weaned kittens. Weaned kittens are the population we'll be talking about next week. We'll be talking about weaning. We'll be talking about, you know, kittens who are ages five, uh, five weeks plus. Um, but this is a great place to start as well. These kittens can eat on their own uh, and they just need a lot of help with, you know, learning uh, behavioral uh, growth. We're going to help them learn how to not bite our hands and climb our pants. <laughs> We're going to um, get these guys healthy and prepared for their adoptive homes. So that's another population you can do. Medical kittens we'll be talking about in week three. And uh, these little ones are really uh, wonderful to foster as well because you get to help them overcome whatever it is they're going through, and you get to uh, really feel so impactful when you foster medical kittens. So we'll be talking about all of the uh, health conditions you might encounter with kittens in week three, but just wanted to say that is a population you can foster. What about feral kittens? That's another population you can foster. Um, these little ones are really fun as well. You can help them on their journey, and we'll be talking about them in week four. But today, we'll be talking about bottle babies, orphaned neonatal kittens, these very young, tiny kittens um, who need all of that extra bottle feeding support. Um, this is my favorite population to foster, and it's also the population that has typically the greatest need. So if you have the ability to do this right now, that's the population that I would encourage you to uh, consider fostering. You might ask yourself if you have enough uh, space in your home to foster. I know that a lot of people say, you know, well, I wish I could foster, but I don't know that I have the room to. And to that I say, maybe you've never seen a kitten, but they're very small. Uh, they are quite small. Uh, they don't need a lot of space at all. I have fostered in, um, you know, studio apartments. I've fostered in houses with six different roommates where I was just fostering out of my bedroom. Uh, it's something that you can really make work. And so I want to show you what an ideal setup for a foster kitten looks like. So an ideal setup is going to be something that's contained. It's going to be climate controlled and comfortably warm. It's not going to be in direct contact with other animals who are not related to them. So litters of kittens can be together. They're all related, uh, but we're not going to be uh, you know, introducing them to a bunch of other kittens or to your resident animals right away. Uh, we also want it to be safe from hazards like toxic plants, loud noises, dangerous objects. Um, you know, we want these, these kittens to be really in a safe, contained space that is also easy to clean and sanitize. Um, all of that is to say you're not taking these kittens home and letting them run loose in your house. You're putting them in some kind of contained space. Um, this is what a contained space can look like for a zero to three week old kitten. Doesn't have to be fancy. Uh, you know, most people start out with something like a cardboard box or a, um, the little plastic tub in the center there is my favorite place to start. Um, I really think that's an ideal setup for a kitten um, zero to three weeks old. So I'm going to show you um, this is the stuff that goes in that space. Uh, this is a little teddy bear companion you can pop in there. You always want to have some kind of heat source and you want to have a soft baby blanket. So here's what that actually looks like in practice. Kittens zero to three weeks old. A top opening carrier, bin, or box. A soft baby blanket. A heat source. And you might want to include a cuddle companion like a little stuffed animal. Kittens two weeks old and under will be very small, very vulnerable, and will sleep about 23 hours a day. I personally like to use a plastic tub because it's easy to clean, sanitize, and look through. And they're so small that they can't get out of the top of it. Or you might opt for a soft carrier. I typically use a soft carrier when I'm on the go with my kittens and a plastic tub when I'm at home. Okay, so that is what an ideal space looks like for a small neonatal kitten under three weeks old. Um, this is baby Ray, and you can see this is really the ideal setup that I would recommend to anyone. Uh, 
the plastic tubs cost you like ten dollars you can get them online get them um, you know at at the store and uh, this is a really really nice setup for a kitten he has here his uh, baby blanket with a heat pad underneath it and his little cuddle companion and there you can see baby Hank with her setup this is a whole world to a little neonatal kitten and they sleep most of the day anyway so that's a great setup you can also see here a kitten aquarium. This is about 15 kittens, um, all in three aquariums. Uh, so you can do a lot with a small amount of space. Uh, you can put this on top of your coffee table, you know, wherever the space is that you have in your home to do this. Um, it really doesn't take up much space. But of course, as the kittens grow older, they're going to uh, start to want to roam around a little more. There's this magical moment between three and four weeks where the kitten suddenly becomes more coordinated and has better eyesight. And they're like, I got to get out of here. I want to see the world. And so that's when we upgrade them. But we're not upgrading them to your entire house. We're upgrading them to a playpen. These playpens are super affordable. Uh, you can find links to playpens on my website. Um, and uh, these are a great option for little kittens. Um, so this is what I would pop into their playpen space. Uh, you're still gonna include a heat pad at three weeks. You can still include their cuddle companion, but you can also start giving them some toys, enrichment, hideaways. I love giving them a little place that they can burrow and hide. Um, and then of course, you know, you're gonna include your baby blanket and as you start to include any food or uh, litter uh, you're going to make sure that it's really shallow so those kittens can actually walk into the litter box um, and reach it accessibly and then also so they can access the food easily so nothing too deep for these little ones but here's what that looks like for our kittens who are um, three weeks plus once kittens reach two and a half to three weeks old they're starting to spend more time awake their vision is improving, and they're becoming more curious about the world around them. I recommend getting a soft-sided playpen with a zip top. These things are awesome because they're safe, they're confined, and they're easy to sanitize. They also fold up easily so you can take them with you to work or to visit a friend or family member for the weekend. Inside the playpen, you'll still want some soft blankets, a heat source, and perhaps your comfort source. But as the kittens get older, there are lots of other things you could consider including, such as toys, the comfy hideaway, or a soft bed. It's really up to you. Just make sure that everything is kitten safe and that they have all the essentials. Okay, so you can see that is like a whole apartment complex for a little kitten who is growing and you know becoming interested in their surroundings. And um, this is what that looks like overhead. Uh, the play pens are great. They come in a lot of different sizes, and you can pop them into the corner of a room or um, you know into your if you have a guest room, wherever it is that you can put that. Um, but it's nice because it is contained, so it does keep them separate from other animals. There's uh, my foster kitten, Numpkin, and he is uh, enjoying his little uh, playpen apartment with his little crinkle ball and all of his blankets. It's a wonderful environment. And if you feel like, I don't know, is that really enough space? You have to think about the, the alternative. The best case scenario would be that they would be in a shelter and they would be there in a... Um, you know, in a metal kennel. So this is actually uh, more space than that typically, and it's uh, a nice, soft, cozy environment for them. So absolutely, you can raise a kitten in a playpen all the way through to adoption age. This is the other option. It's a plastic uh, playpen that you can click together. I really like this because you can make it fit the room. Um, so, you know, you can make it into an L shape or you can make it a small one or a gigantic one. Uh, we recently decided that we wanted to uh, do this in our bedroom. So we made like a big one that took up all of the space in our bedroom so that the kittens were still contained, uh, but they, you know, had lots of space. So I really like these playpen setups and you can find what works best for your space. Now, what about if you have cats at home already? A lot of people say, I would foster, but I, you know, I have cats at home already. And the truth is most people who foster kittens do already have cats at home. Um, I have three cats at home and, uh, you know, two of them hate kittens and one of them loves kittens. Obviously, this is the one who loves kittens. Um, and whether your cats love kittens or hate kittens, the thing to know is that you're never bringing kittens home with the goal of integrating them with your cats and making it so that everybody's getting along in your home. That's really not the goal of fostering. The goal of fostering, of course, is 
to get those kittens healthy and get them out of your house. Um, now, uh, you no matter what, want to have a minimum quarantine period of two weeks for your kittens. That two week period is going to give you the opportunity to keep an eye on your kittens, monitor for any health conditions. During that time, you're also doing their preventative care so you know that that kitten is getting dewormed. They're not going to have you know, conditions that can spread to your cat. Uh, you wanna really take at least two weeks to make sure that those kittens are robust and healthy. Uh, you always wanna wash your hands after working with kittens. We all know the importance of quarantine and washing hands right now, uh, but kitten people, we already knew this, right guys? Uh, it's very, very important uh, that if you have a kitten who has an unknown health history, which most of them do, we're just gonna you know, practice precaution. Wash our hands, keep them separate, no sharing supplies, no sharing litter boxes, no booping noses, no letting your cat lick their butt. Um, you know, we wanna keep them separate for at least two weeks. Of course, we're gonna keep our cats up to date on vaccines. You should be doing that anyway, but certainly when you're fostering, that is um, even more important. And then finally, the way that you can set this up, uh, you know, you can do this in a spare room if you have one, but if you don't have a spare room, that's okay. You can see here, Haroon is separated from our foster kittens by the plastic panels. And so they don't have to be on like total lockdown. They just have to not be able to physically interact with one another. Um, I recommend uh, if you are gonna have them in your common space, put that playpen in an area that is not near your cat's favorite areas, right? So you, if cats are given the opportunity to avoid, they will typically avoid rather than be aggressive. So don't put the kittens next to your cat's favorite uh, cat tree. Put them you know, in a corner of the living room that your cat doesn't walk near anyway. Um, and really, you, know, you have to let your cat decide. Uh, after a couple of weeks, if the kittens are healthy and robust and your cat wants to interact with them, then that's up to you. Haroon really loves uh, working with our foster kittens once they're about six seven weeks old, um, if they're healthy at that age, uh, we will let him interact with them. But you may not have this situation with your cats and that's totally fine. Um, the next picture I'll show is very old. This is like a nine or 10 year old photo that I pulled up of my cat Coco. Uh, and she was interacting, as you can see, with one of my uh, old foster kittens. And this was, this was before I had the sense to know, don't force your cat to interact with your foster kittens. Um, you know, I never ever have Coco and Eloise, my other cat, um, interact with my foster kittens because it's a bad experience for my cat and it's also a bad experience for the foster kitten. So let your cat choose. Um, but ultimately, the, the goal is to keep everybody safe, keep everybody happy, and of course your cat always comes first. Now you might ask, does it cost a lot to foster? Um, some people think that they're going to take on a big financial burden if they start fostering. But the important thing to know is that when you foster for an animal shelter uh, or a rescue organization, they are sponsoring the care of that kitten. So your medical care is going to be covered and in some cases, some supplies may be covered. It depends on the organization. So the important thing to do is reach out and you can ask them, hey, you know, what is included if I foster? Are you able to uh, provide for the kitten in uh, ways that are medical, like vaccines, dewormers? I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, they're gonna say yes. And then what about supplies? That's the other thing you wanna consider. Um, a lot of animal shelters and rescue programs do provide some or all of the supplies. That's why they have donors. Um, they want to have the supplies so that you don't have to spend any uh, any money on this. Uh, that's the goal, I think, for most programs. And I can tell you, uh, my nonprofit, Orphan Kitten Club, a huge part of our grants uh, that we do for kitten programs is helping shelters and rescues access these kitten supply kits so that people um, don't have to, you know, it doesn't cost foster parents anything except time and love uh, to foster. These are um, some kits that we just donated this week to the San Diego Humane Society here. Um, and you can see what's in these kits. This is like a fully loaded foster kit, of course. Um, some organizations will vary in what they can provide. So again, definitely talk to your organization, but um, you know, some organizations are gonna be able to give you a great kit like this that has a scale and a heat pad and um, you know, nutritious food for the kitten to eat and baby blankets and all the stuff that you need. So uh, if you're not able to get supplies through your organization, one thing you can do is 
seek another organization that can help you. But you can also do a kitten shower. Uh, kitten shower is like a baby shower, but with kittens. Uh, so super, super cute. You can, uh, right now, since people aren't able to socially gather, you could totally do an online kitten shower with a wish list and ask your friends to participate over you know, Zoom or whatever you want to do. Uh, super cute idea. Great way to ask people to get involved. And just in general, the foster community is very supportive. We all want to help each other out. Uh, so supplies ideally should not be um, an issue of concern for you. Um, in terms of finding what supplies you need, again, you can find that on my website. If you go to kittenlady.org slash supplies, I have a lot of uh, recommendations on there. So let's talk about uh, how to tell what age a kitten is. This is maybe the most important thing that you can learn because uh, when you're taking in a kitten for the first time, you, you won't really know what's um, normal, what to expect, and what kind of care to provide if you don't know what age they are. So let's go through um, week by week and talk about kitten development. So the kitten on the left here is a newborn kitten. Uh, a newborn kitten is going to have their eyes closed. Their ears will be folded, but they also will have their ear canals shut. So these kittens can't hear you. Um, if you wake them up, hi, sweetheart, um, they're not going to wake up to the sound of your voice at that age. Um, these little ones don't have a gag reflex. They're super, super vulnerable at this age. Uh, they can't regulate their own body temperature at all. Now at one week, um, you can see that this kitten looks a little bit more robust than our newborn. Uh, the newborn kitten will have an umbilical cord attached, and if the umbilical cord is still wet, then they are probably um, truly a newborn within the last 24 hours. But around five days old, uh, that stump will have dried up and it will typically fall off. So by one week old, we have this kitten who has a smooth belly, no umbilical stump typically. At one week, the kitten's eyes will usually still be closed. Their ears will be folded. However, uh, seven days, around seven days, the kitten's ear canals will start to slowly open. So you might notice that when you pop your head into their little tub and say, good morning, uh, a seven-day-old kitten may actually wake up and respond. Uh, their eyes will start to open at 8 to 12 days old. And their eyes look a little silly while they're opening. I'll show you what that looks like. But in general, a, a seven-day-old kitten will have their eyes closed. Uh, be between 8 and 12 days, their eyes are going to open, and then by two weeks, they're going to have these beautiful baby blue eyes. All kittens are going to have blue eyes when they're born, and those eyes transition around six to seven weeks to their adult color. Now, all of these kittens are not great uh, at coordination. They're not great at walking. Two-week-old kitten is going to be wobbly on their feet, maybe trying to get around a little bit, but these are not very mobile kittens. So these little ones are our teeny tinies. They are our most vulnerable kittens. Um, you know, none of these guys can thermoregulate. All of them do need uh, around-the-clock care. Now let's move on to our three-week-old. Oh! Sorry, let's talk about the, what the eyes look like. I just wanted to show you this uh, because it might be alarming to you when you see a kitten opening their eyes for the first time. So here we have a kitten who is seven days or under, um, and we know that because the eyes are fully shut. And uh, they, when their eyes are fully shut like this, you don't wanna manually open their eyes. The body will do that on its own. Um, but at eight days, nine days, 10 days old, they're gonna look like this and it's a little silly looking. Um, so I want you to know if you see a kitten who looks like this, um, that that's normal, that's what their eyes look like. They start to open from the tear duct outward. Um, the only thing that would not be normal is if you saw um, pus or something like that in the eye, but if the eye looks clean and clear and it just looks a little silly like this, just give them a couple days and uh, the eye will, will open up. Uh, this kitten was really sweet. He always had his tongue sticking out, uh, and here he is when his eyes fully open. So that's our two-week-old kitten. So that's what that transition looks like. Okay, let's move on to three weeks. So our three-week-old kitten is a magical age. This is the age that the teeth start coming in, the incisors are emerging, the ears are unfolding, they start to look a little bit more like a baby cat at this age, and three weeks might be an age where they start discovering the litter box. That happens typically between three and four weeks, different time for different kittens, but um, around three weeks is when they stop um, being so dependent on uh, stimulation to help them go to the bathroom. 
four weeks is my favorite age, I think, because this is the age where their vision really improves. Suddenly you're looking at the kitten, they're looking right back at you. And their coordination has improved very, very much. Um, between three and four weeks old, kittens are able to start really walking confidently. Um, they can't run and climb yet, and they don't really play very much yet, uh, but they can walk confidently. And the important thing about a four-week-old to know is that um, their coordination is coming in right at the same time that their vision is coming in. And so they this is a really great um, hand-eye coordination or paw-eye coordination age. You can start to show them a little toy and they'll actually um, track it with their eye and look back and forth and maybe even reach out to touch it. Um, those are great activities you can be doing with a four-week-old kitten to help them um, get confident navigating their space and interacting with objects in the environment. Five weeks old, um, our kittens are gonna be weaning onto wet food, their premolars are emerging, and five weeks is where this talk today will end um, because next week we'll pick up with our five and six week old kittens. Um, so I'll just briefly show you what that age looks like. This is our six, seven, and eight week old kittens. And this is typically when the kitten is um, you know, preparing for their forever home. We'll be talking about that in the next webinar. Um, but none of the kittens on this page are bottle babies. All of these guys are weaned. All of them are, um, you know, confidently becoming uh, little micro cats, right? So uh, we'll talk about these ages next week, but I just wanted to show you what they look like. Now, if you're not sure what age your kitten is, pop open their mouth and look at their teeth because the truth is in the tooth. So I'm gonna go through week by week and show you what their teeth look like. And I wanna mention that uh, the teeth of the kitten are a great indicator, not just of age, but also of uh, what they're able to do at this age. So let's take a look at a two week old's mouth. This is the mouth of a two week old kitten. Do you see any teeth in there? There's no teeth in there. This is all gums. So if you open a kitten's mouth and you just see a nice little gummy smile, uh, that kitten is two weeks or younger um, or in the two week range. And uh, with gums, these kittens cannot uh, consume meat. They can't hunt. They can't do much of anything other than sleep and nurse on their mom. And that's exactly what these kittens do. Now around three weeks old, you're gonna open their mouth and go, oh my gosh, look at that you got the cutest little baby teeth at the front of your mouth. So adorable. Um, this is the incisors, and those are those tiny front teeth at the front of your cat's mouth. Um, the incisors, of course, are very small, and these are not for hunting. These are not for um, consuming food. So uh, if you see a kitten with these teeth, don't be fooled. This kitten cannot eat meat at this age. Um, the incisors are actually used for grooming. So I don't know if you've ever seen your cat at home, um, you know, they're grooming themselves and then they take their little teeth and they do um, some biting on their arm, like almost like they're eating corn on the cob like this. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? Well, that is uh, them using their incisors as a comb. They're actually combing through their fur with their incisors. So interestingly, at three weeks old, you'll see these kittens um, starting to do some grooming behaviors um, using their incisors, using their tongue. But these kittens can't eat on their own yet. Four weeks old, we're gonna see kittens get their uh, canine teeth. And those are, of course, the big fang teeth that pop up on the sides right there. Those teeth are for hunting. Um, they're for uh, grasping around an object. And so four weeks, of course, they have their improved vision, they have their improved coordination, and they have these great little incisor teeth that can wrap around a toy. So these kittens are great at um, you know, learning how to play. It's a great age to teach them how to play. But these kittens are not ready to consume fully a diet of meat yet. Um, it's really once they get their premolars, these teeth on the side here, um, that they are fully loaded with teeth, ready to take on uh, life beyond the bottle. That's what we'll be talking about uh, next week, but these are our five week old kittens. So I just want you to know that, uh, you know, if you're not sure what age a kitten is, pop open their mouth. Here we have two, three, four, and five week old kittens. Um, and this, this age is all gonna be our bottle babies up until the um, five week stage where we start to wean them. Okay, sorry, I should have warned you guys, but if you think you're not gonna see cat butts in my talks, you're wrong. 
Um, <laughs> this is uh, how you can tell what sex a kitten is. So on the left here, we have a female kitten, and you'll see that if you look under the tail of a kitten, um, you're going to see that either uh, they're female or male. On a female, you're gonna see something that looks a little bit like a line or like a teardrop and that's gonna be really, really close to their butt. There's not a lot of fur in the middle there, is there? It's really right, right next to their butt, and it looks kind of flat, like a line or a teardrop. Compare that to the male kitten. He has a lot of fur in between his genitals and his butt, and it looks like a mound. There's a little bit of um, like a raised texture to it, and it's circular. So if you are looking under a kitten's tail and you're trying to figure out if they're female or male, you're gonna ask yourself, does this look like a flat line with not a lot of fur in the middle? Or does this look like a circular mound with a lot of fur in the middle? That fur is where the kitten's testicles will descend um, and they'll keep those for a short period of time until we neuter them, of course. Uh, and, uh, and that is how you can tell if they're male or female. So uh, now we're gonna do a little pop quiz and I'm gonna have you guys call out uh, in your homes or you can put it in the chat. Do you think this kitten is male or female? Okay, let's do a quiz. Okay, what do you think? If you guessed male, you're correct. What do you think? If you guessed female, you're right. Okay, last one. Any guesses? If you guessed male, you're right. Okay, how did you do? Well, let me know how you did in the chat. I hope that you guys uh, did well. Okay, so let's move on to talking about heat sources. It's very important to know that if you're caring for a kitten under four weeks of age, they do have to have a heat source. It's not optional. You have to give them a heat source because these kittens cannot thermoregulate. They can't um, keep themselves warm. They rely totally on mom and on huddling to stay warm. So they do have an instinct to seek radiant heat from their mother um, from birth. So they actually, even though they can't see and they can't hear, they can move towards and away from heat. So we're gonna give them that option. We're gonna give them the option of a warm space and a cool space. Here are some uh, typical examples of heating sources you can use with kittens. Um, there are definitely pros and cons to any, either of them, um, but the, the first one on the left here is a microwavable heat pad called a snuggle safe. Um, that's what a lot of foster parents use. I have them in my home. I really like them. Um, you microwave it for a couple of minutes and it stays warm for several hours. Um, you know, the benefit of that is you don't have to plug anything in. It's a little easier to take on the go or put in a carrier. Um, but you do have to have a microwave and you do have to heat them every couple hours. Um, now, the electric heat pads can be great. You just have to make sure that you don't have one that turns off after two hours because that is, a lot of them do turn off. Um, so you might think the kitten is warm, but they actually, um, the timer has gone off. Um, of course, those are also uh, great for a, a stationary area, but they're not great for um, if you're taking a kitten on the go. And then a lot of people do this rice sock. Um, you know, you put uh, dry rice into a sock, tie a knot at the end of the sock and microwave that. Um, that's okay in a pinch. It's something that I'll do if I have no other option. Uh, it does have some nice uh, radiant heat coming off of it, but it, it does um, tend to cool down quite quickly. So if you're doing a rice mom, you're gonna have to be heating that up pretty regularly. And then of course, um, an incubator is something that's an option if you're doing a lot of kittens all the time. Um, they have you know, very consistent, precise regulation of their temperature, but the, the thing there is just that they are a bulky and expensive device, so not something I would recommend to the casual foster parent, um, but maybe something good for shelters or people who foster very frequently. A few tips here, um, you wanna always cover 
your heat pad. You never want to just give them like a snuggle safe with nothing over it. Uh, that can be pretty harsh direct heat. And we don't want to burn or, um, you know, overheat our kittens either. So we want to put some kind of nice, super soft blanket and also their snuggle companion. So they kind of get to go get in there and get snuggly with their stuffed animal. And then you also want to provide them a cool zone because these kittens, like I said, they can move away and towards heat. So we don't ever want them to just have access to a hot area. We want them to have um, access to warmth and also the ability to get away from it if they get too warm. Let's talk about weighing kittens. Very important that you are weighing your kittens daily, at least daily. Every single day, you want to see your kittens gaining at least somewhere in the 7 um, to 14 grams per day range is a good range. Um, I use a gram scale for this, um, which is going to be like a kitchen scale, something that you weigh food with. They're like $10. You can get them online. Um, and the way that you weigh your kittens is put some kind of bowl on top of it with a blanket in the bowl. And then make sure you tear the scale, which means that it says zero with all of the items on top of it. Then you can place your kitten into the bowl and the kitten will stay put because they're contained. Um, you can weigh kittens at least once a day uh, with the little ones or with any kittens who are having any kind of health condition. I would weigh them at every single feeding, perhaps even um, pre and post feeding weight. So here's what it looks like when I am weighing a kitten. These are um, some kittens in this video that I had just gotten in. Um, so I'm just learning who they are and how much they weigh. We're gonna find out the weight of the gray with socks. 157. 157 grams. So tiny. 121. 141. Okay. Okay, so you can see that that bowl keeps them nice and contained for the moment that you need them in there to weigh them. This is a kitten growth and monitoring chart. I'll send this as a supplemental material to everybody who uh, signed up and registered today. Um, but you can also access this in my book, Tiny But Mighty. Uh, but you can see you want to write it down because you're tracking their weight, not just you know for your own fun, but also uh, because you want to make sure that their weight is always going up. These guys are supposed to be growing, right? So we'll talk a lot more about target weights um, in the third webinar, uh, but this is just some general information. Every foster parent should have a scale for their kittens. Okay, so now that you have a sense of the kitten's age and weight, um, you can start to plan your routine. And your routine for kittens is always going to be the same. They're always going to go to the bathroom, they're always gonna have a bottle, they're always going to get cleaned up, and then they're gonna go back to bed. Um, the only thing that changes is the frequency of your feedings. So as the kittens grow older, they have a larger stomach capacity and they're able to hold more food um, in between feedings. Their, their feedings are not as frequent. This is what a kitten care schedule might look like. Of course, this is a guideline. This is not a rule book, but this is generally what you would expect. Um, I don't want people to take this as a rule, though. Uh, every kitten is going to be different. The important thing is that they are gaining weight um, and that they are eating, right? Uh, so this is a good guide. You can see that the weight is going to go up every week. The stomach capacity and amount that they eat at each feeding is going to go up per week. And then also the frequency of feeding is going to go down. So the older they get, you get a little bit more of a break in between feedings. But it is true you do have to feed those newborn kittens quite frequently. Think about how often mom would be with them. She'd be with them pretty much all day. So we want to make sure that we're giving them that uh, opportunity as well when they're very young. So I want to show you what a bottle baby care routine looks like, and then we'll break it down into its parts. Um, but this is just a video showing the whole routine, what you can expect. This video, I'm going to show you guys my neonatal kitten routine in my nursery and show you kind of how the flow works when I'm working with a litter of kittens to do their kitten routine. So as you can see, in this room, we have two incubators where the kittens live until they're three weeks old. The kittens I'm going to be working with today are two and a half weeks old, which means they're eating about every three and a half hours. So it is time for them to eat, and I'm going to show you guys their routine. So what I do when it's time to feed them is take one of them out. Dollop's always at the front. Close this back up. And then right here I have my tissues. So I just grab a couple tissues and I stimulate them to go to the bathroom. 
Dollop is going pee. After they go to the bathroom, I turn the scale on and I get a pre-feeding weight on the kitten in grams. Dollop's pre-feeding weight is 353 grams. Next up, I feed the kitten. Now that Dollop has had her food, I put her back in the scale and I get a post-feeding weight. She is 359. So that means that she gained six grams with her eating. Now after they eat, you might need to clean them up. So I go into my wipe warmer and I pull out a wipe, and then I just clean her up. I clean her little face, and I clean her little butt. And that's it, once she's all cleaned up, she can go back into the incubator. Okay, so that is what the full routine looks like, um, but now let's break it down into its parts. So the first thing you saw me doing is stimulating the kitten to go to the bathroom. Um, now that is something that you do with kittens who are zero to about three weeks old. Every kitten's going to um, you know, be on a different timeline, but it usually goes up until around three, three and a half weeks. And that is because mom would typically lick her young to help them go to the bathroom. So mom usually licks her young and then they know to go potty and she actually consumes their waste, which is amazing. So if you have a mom and babies, you don't have to do this part. Um, mom will do this for you and even clean them up fully. So you're like, where's the poop? It's amazing. Um, <laughs> when you're a foster mom, you don't have to be so loving as a uh, mom cat would be in that way. We're just going to stimulate them uh, with a tissue and then you just toss their waste in the waste basket. Um, so we're going to choose some kind of absorbent tissue for this. So a tissue um, like you would blow your nose with or toilet paper. We're not going to use anything really harsh like those hand towels you get in like a public restroom. We're not going to use that. Something very soft and absorbent. Um, after we stimulate them to go to the bathroom, we're going to use a baby wipe to clean them up. So I'm going to show you in this next video, um, this is what it looks like when I'm stimulating a kitten. Um, you're just rubbing the area gently in a circular motion during the whole duration of them going to the bathroom. So you, it's not something that you start doing and then stop when they're going. You stop once they've stopped going. So you're stimulating them the entire time. And there's not really a right or a wrong posture to have them in for this. Um, you know, you can, you can really have them in whatever posture makes the most sense for you. Just make sure that afterwards you clean them up. Now they're going to pee every single time that they're stimulated if you're feeding them on their regular schedule. So, um, you know, if you have a kitten who is on a three hour schedule, that means three hours is the amount of time it takes for them to consume the food, have that food pass through their body um, and turn into urine. And that kitten is going to have to pee before they do their next feeding, right? So um, we're gonna help them go to the bathroom first. Their pee should be clear or light yellow. If their pee is really dark, that could be a sign that they're dehydrated. And we'll talk all about dehydration in the third webinar. So um, don't worry, we will talk about all of the health side of this. Um, this is more the care side that we're talking about today. So, um, you know, you want to make sure that uh, your kitten is peeing every single time that they're on their care schedule. The next slide has poop on it. So if you don't want to see a kitten poop, just look away for a moment. Um, but we are talking about babies here. So there's a lot of poop involved. Okay. So this is my foster kitten, Texas Pete, and his very large poop that he's showing off like Vanna White. Um, he's very proud of this poop because this is a good looking kitten poop. Um, it's a very large kitten poop. Size of the poop does not matter, but the texture and color is what you're looking at um, to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, so this is what a standard bottle baby poop will look like. It's gonna be kind of mustard yellow and you want it to have form like this. You want it to have a shape to it. Um, I'm going to be talking all about poop in the third webinar, so um, I highly recommend uh, watching that one. But the important thing to know is that um, kittens don't poop at every feeding, typically. Um, they might poop once a day. They might poop twice a day. They might poop six times a day. They might not poop for a day. Uh, poop is a funny thing with kittens. And uh, the important thing is that they are regular in some kind of fashion. Um, and if they don't poop for a day, uh, don't panic. Just make sure there's no other signs of distress present, like straining or crying. Um, 
but in most cases, we're going to expect to see them poop maybe twice a day. Um, when a kitten is about to poop, you're going to be stimulating them and you're going to feel their abdomen start to tense up. When you feel their abdomen start to become tense, that is a sign that, oh, this kitten's about to poop. And it, it, some people have a hard time getting a kitten to poop. Um, I pride myself on being great at getting kittens to poop because I can feel their abdomen is starting to tense up. And that's when you know, okay, this is not the time to stop stimulating. We're going to keep stimulating them. Obviously, you're not stimulating directly over their butt when they're pooping. So we're going to stimulate on the side. We're going to take our tissue and just stimulate on the side of their butt, help them the entire time that they're pooping, encourage them, be sweet to them. They can be kind of like, what's happening to me? Um, so keep stimulating them the whole time that they're pooping. And of course, take a look at what their poop looks like. If it doesn't look like a formed um, stool, then you definitely want to talk to your foster coordinator or veterinarian about that. And I'll talk all about the various things you can see with poop in the Keeping Kittens Healthy webinar um, in two weeks. But let's move on to bottle feeding. Um, so with bottle feeding, you want to be feeding your kitten a proper diet. You don't want to feed them anything you have in your fridge at home. So no cow's milk, no home remedies, don't look up a recipe on the internet, um, don't feed them dairy alternatives, and don't feed them human baby formula. All of those things are not a nutritionally complete diet for a kitten. We have to feed them something that is designed to meet their unique needs. So find something that says kitten formula on it. Um, when you're preparing your bottle, you want to make sure that it is fresh. You don't want to make enough formula to feed the kitten for the next year <laughs> uh, or even the next three days because as soon as you mix your formula, it has the ability to start growing bacteria on it. So we want it to be nice and fresh. Make enough that they'll eat one, maybe two feedings and then refrigerate um, the rest of it and refrigerate the powder once it's opened. You also want to make sure it's clump free. If there's clumps in your formula, it's going to clog the bottle. So you might think this kitten doesn't want to eat, but actually they just can't eat because it's clogged, right? So we want to make sure that we are blending that somehow. You can use a little whisk or you can use a blender bottle or something like that. Um, make sure that it's warm. Use warm water. Test it on your wrist. It should be comfortable. If you put that formula on your wrist and go, oh, that hurts, it's too hot, or, oh, that's quite cold. Um, you know, that's not what we want. We want nice, just comfortably warm formula. Here's what goes in your bottle. Some kind of kitten formula, and make sure that it is for kittens. It's not like a cat milk treat or something like that, kitten formula. We're gonna mix it with water. Now, in some cases, we're gonna mix it with Pedialyte or some kind of electrolyte replacer, um, and that is something that we'll talk about in the third webinar, but I really like using some kind of electrolyte replacer to mix with my powder formula. Um, if the kitten is new to foster care, if they are dehydrated, if they're going through some kind of health condition, um, that might be something ideal to do. And I do really recommend the powder over um, any kind of liquid formula that you can buy at the store. I really like the powders more. Gives you more flexibility to um, mix it with something like, like an electrolyte solution. Um, and it also, I just have better results with the powders. Um, they're, they last longer, easier to store. Um, so I do recommend a powder formula. So once you've mixed your water and your formula, you are going to blend it. Um, and you can do that with a little mini whisk or some kind of smoothie shaker and then pour it into a kitten bottle. Um, don't get like a human baby bottle. You have to get one that is going to fit the kitten's mouth. Now, most of the bottles, um, they come with a nipple that has no hole in the end of it. That's really important to know because if you try to feed this kitten, um, they're not going to be able to eat if there's no hole at the end of it. So here's a video on what to do to cut a hole. Most nipples will not come pre-cut. There are a lot of different ways that people do this, including cutting an X or cutting a V into the nipple. My preferred method is to cut the nipple on an angle so that just a small hole is visible. Cutting the hole properly is important because it will determine the flow of the formula while the kitten is nursing. Test the hole by turning the bottle upside down. The formula should slowly drip out one drop at a time if the hole is the correct size. If you turn it upside down and nothing flows out, you need to enlarge the hole. If you turn it upside down and it flows too quickly, then you'll have to try again with a new nipple. Okay, so that is 
um, just a guideline on using the nipples that come on the bottles, but there are also other attachments you can get. Um, this is called a miracle nipple and that's what I use and I really love uh, you can see that they look very similar to the actual nipple of a cat um, so I find that these are a little bit more natural feeling for the kitten and they come with a hole already cut on the end of it so this is the miracle nipple mini and that's what I would recommend um, they are a little expensive but you can reuse them um, just make sure that you're sanitizing them after each litter um, but you can reuse them you can pop them onto a bottle um, and I really really do uh, recommend that product now you want to make sure that you're feeding the kitten in a natural posture I show this photo so you can see you know when a kitten is feeding on their mom what does that really look like well it looks like the baby laying next to the mom with their belly facing down um, and you know they're going to be so cozy with their mom um, they're you know going to be in a specific position that might be different than the position you're trying to put them in um, so let's try to feed them in as natural of a posture and as natural feeling of an environment as possible so they should be in a position where their belly is down horizontal towards the ground. I get a lot of questions about, well, what if the kitten sits up or um, tries to stand? All of that is okay as long as the belly is generally facing more down than it is up. So we want our kittens to be in a forward posture um, with their head uh, in front of their, their hind limbs, right? Um, but ideally, you know, we want them to be in some kind of position like this. We never want to feed a kitten on her back because that can cause aspiration. Aspiration is where the kitten is actually um, inhaling the, the fluid down into their lungs, which can be deadly for them. So let's avoid aspiration. Let's feed them in a proper posture. Now this video, I'm going to show you two different postures for kittens, and you'll see each kitten do both postures. And I want to show that all the way through so you can see um, what it looks like. Uh, really when you're actually feeding a kitten um, the the posture that you feed them in with your hands um, the position it is just important that you have a couple of general principles that you'll see in this video the kitten is uh, in a posture that is safe for them belly down you can feel that they're swallowing with a finger um, and you're guiding their head so let's watch this little video and see um, some safe postures for kittens Today, I'm going to show you my two favorite postures for bottle feeding. So when you're bottle feeding a kitten, obviously you want to do it in a safe and proper posture. And I want to show you two different ways that I like to do it, depending on the kitten's preference. So no matter what, you're always going to start by grabbing your bottle with your dominant hand. I'm right-handed, so I grab my bottle with my right hand. And then with my non-dominant hand, I'm going to pick up the kitten. Now for this first posture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my index finger and my thumb and I'm going to place that on the sides of the kitten's head. So I'm just gently grasping the sides of the kitten's head. I'm not squeezing, I'm just helping her get in position. Then with my middle finger, I'm going to actually lay that across her throat. So it looks like this and then the middle finger comes onto the throat. Here's what that posture looks like. So Pepita doesn't really love that posture. What she really likes is my second posture, which is using this space between your index finger and your thumb to do an overhand feed. So I'm gonna take that space and put it over her head. And then with my index finger, I can feel that she's swallowing. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. can see Pepita really prefers this method. So for the first posture, I'm taking my index finger and my thumb, and I'm placing it on the sides of the kitten's head like this. Then I am going to take my middle finger and put it on the kitten's throat so that I can feel that they're swallowing. So gently grasping the sides of the head, placing a finger on the throat, and then inserting the bottle into the mouth. I can feel that he's gulping and he's very, very happy. So that's the first posture. Then for the second posture, we have the overhand. I'm going to take this space in between my index finger and my thumb, and I'm going to lay it 
over his head like this. Now I can feel that he's swallowing using my index finger. So both of these methods are perfectly good. Some kittens prefer this second method. I think it allows them to feel like they're really rooting and it actually partially covers their eyes. So it makes some nice darkness, but really either method is perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay. So um, you could see in that video, there's a couple different positions, hand positions that you can feed the kitten in, but all of them are meeting the same general principles. Um, the first is that we are holding the kitten's head in place for stabilization during feeding. Um, and the reason I say that is a lot of people are kind of scared to handle the kitten when they are first bottle feeding, um, but you have to guide the kitten. They don't know what's going on. Um, so you have to really be their guide. And that means that you're going to actually hold their head gently in place um, while you're introducing the nipple into the mouth, especially when the kitten is first getting used to bottle feeding. Um, when you introduce the nipple into the mouth, you're going to invert the bottle. So you can see the bottle is actually um, held up on an angle. That allows gravity to help some of that formula come down. But also we want to make sure that it's at an angle where the fluid line is above the hole where the kitten is actually suckling. So we never want to have so little formula in the bottle that they're actually suckling air, right? We want them to only be suckling formula. Um, you don't ever want to squeeze the bottle. You can apply the lightest amount of pressure to the bottle just to kind of pressurize it, let one drop fall out of the bottom of it, but you never squeeze a bottle into a kitten's mouth. The reason being that if you squeeze formula into a kitten's mouth, it could possibly go down into their lungs, right? So we want the kitten to be guiding the flow. Ideally, the kitten will roll her tongue like a taco and latch. And that is really what we want to see with these little ones is a latch. You can see this kitten is latched. And in this video, I'll show you what a good latch looks like. Latching is when a kitten makes a U shape with her tongue and suckles to drink the formula. You'll know she's latched when she looks like she's very engaged and active, maybe even with the telltale ear wiggle. Place a finger on her throat to ensure that she's swallowing as she eats. You'll be able to feel each gulp, which will let you know that she's eating properly. Here's what a good latch looks like. All right. So you can see that kitten is definitely engaged and latching. That's what we ideally would like to see. Now, what about syringe feeding? Syringe feeding is something that some people like to do. I like to do it mostly with kittens who are under 10 days old. Um, that's because sometimes, you know, these guys are eating a really small quantity of food, so um, you can really measure out what they're eating quite well. You do have um, a little bit more control over the flow because you can press it very, very, very slowly. Uh, but it's important to know that with syringe feeding, there is an increased risk of aspiration. So please, if you are syringe feeding a kitten, do it extremely slowly, one drop at a time. If you're not sure if you're doing it right, just go back to the bottle. The kitten controls the flow a little bit better on a bottle than on a syringe. Um, some other advice for syringe feeding, please, if you're using a syringe, um, don't reuse the same one over and over and over. Even if you're cleaning it, they can get a little bit um, tacky and then it is hard for the kitten to, um, to eat. You're pressing it and it can kind of get stuck and then it presses very quickly um, and it can actually make the kitten aspirate. So we wanna be very, very careful. Don't reuse single-use syringes in that way. Um, but this is what it looks like. This is that same kitten, Gordon, um, on a syringe. And I just want you to see how slow this goes. It's extremely slow, one tiny drop at a time. You can't do it slowly enough. So just be very careful if you are syringe feeding. Um, you can see one tiny drop at a time. Okay. What if the kitten won't latch? That's a big question I always get. And the truth is that even with my kittens, most of the time, if I get a brand new kitten in, um, they don't latch very well for the first maybe two, three feedings until they get used to it. So it's important to know that even if a kitten won't latch, you still do need to get some nutrition into them, right? Um, so uh, there's some things that we can do. The first thing is check for errors. You know, is there something wrong with the bottle? Did you cut a hole in it? Um, is the formula clumping? Is the formula too cold? Is it not comfortable for them? 
Uh, you know, you can also do lots of things that I'll explain on the next uh, video to help them be a little more comfortable. But in general, you know, you want to be very patient with your kittens. If you're getting frustrated because they're frustrated, um, then I highly encourage you to put the kitten down take a deep breath, you know, go for a little walk, come back, do it again. Um, we have to be really gentle with them. Um, if a kitten truly will not latch, then one drop at a time can be fed. Um, you're applying one drop onto the tongue and then watching them swallow it. One drop onto the tongue, watching them swallow it. And placing a finger on the throat is going to help ensure that they really are doing that. But ideally, the goal is always to get them to latch and engage. Now, in this video, I'm going to talk about um, some strategies for keeping the kitten comforted so that they will actually uh, latch. Because one thing to keep in mind is when we're fostering kittens, you know, this is not natural feeling for them. They do have a natural instinct to root and to suckle, um, but what the situations we're putting them in don't always feel very natural to them. So what can we do to make this feel more like they really are with their mom? Because with mom, you know, they're gonna know what to do. So what are some things we can do? In this video, I'll show a little bit about that. In the wild, a mama cat will hide her babies in a nice, cozy, warm nesting area. And that's where they'll stay for the first weeks of life. But when we foster kittens, we might take them out of their nesting area and plop them onto a cold table or into our lap. And that's not really natural for them. So something that might help is feeding them in their warm, cozy nesting box where they feel most comfortable and at ease. Research shows that the suckling reflex is strongest the moment that kittens wake up. So if you've got a tricky baby, try mimicking the way they would eat from their mama. They would be asleep, the mama would wake them up by licking, and then they would instantly start to root around, find a nipple, and suckle. So you can mimic this by waking them up with a gentle tooth brushing, and then instantly show them that nice warm bottle. It's easy to see that Kabu loves her stuffed animal mama, and so it can be nice to give her this while she's actually nursing. You can take the kitten and plop them right on top of their stuffed animal companion while they have their bottle. Kabu's already rooting around looking for food. Are you looking for food? <laughs> Not yet, little one. Or if you really want to get creative, you can get yourself some plush gloves. These also mimic the comfort of a mama. I know the plush gloves are a little silly, but they're such a cute idea. Um, the idea here really is like, what can we do to make it feel more natural for the kitten? Feeding them in a place that is dark and cozy, where they're really contained, um, you know, feeding them in their nesting box where it smells like them and their family and they're comfortable in there. Um, anything you can do to make it feel like a more natural um, setting for them is going to result in better results for um for latching. So I have more on that, uh, on the longer version of that video as well. Um, you can find that on my YouTube. It's just called uh, 10 Tips for Tricky Bottle Babies. Now, comfort is absolutely critical. When you're working with little kittens, um, comfort makes a big difference. We know that stress has negative implications for kittens um, and any animals in terms of their health, their happiness, their behavior. Um, so we want to make sure that we're making our kittens as comfortable as we possibly can. Uh, one way of making sure kittens are comfortable is by making sure they have a routine. It's very uh, easy for us to do that in a foster home. We can get them on that comfortable routine where they know that you know they're going to be fed, they're going to be clean, they know that um, you know they have all of their needs met. That's very comforting to them. Um, but we also want to be mindful that these kittens, you know, they're really sensitive to things like touch and sound and smell. Um, smell in particular is a big one for kittens because they're born with that intact. So, you know, in this picture of baby Ray, he might be very bonded to his stuffed animal because that's all that he knows. And it starts to smell familiar to him. So when we take that away from him, that can be a little jarring. Um, so we always want to be mindful of that. If you're doing laundry for your kittens, maybe consider leaving one familiar smell in there. You know, take the blanket, but don't take the teddy bear. Uh, you know, think, think about what it's like uh, when you remove everything from a kitten all at once. So we want to be thinking about um, their comfort at all times. Some supplies that you could consider for comforting kittens. Um, definitely a cuddle companion is something for every kitten, but essential for um, those little solo babies. We always want to give them a cuddle companion. I recommend a hideaway. Uh, you know, you can get these cute little 
huts that are shaped like strawberries or pineapples or sharks. Uh, but if you don't have one of those, just give them a little box, like just somewhere where they can feel contained, like they have a little place to go hide. Uh, the neck pillows are nice because they can kind of burrow in there and that can be quite cozy for them. Soft, soft, soft blankets. We always want everything to be nice and cushy for them. But then uh, the toothbrush is a thing that uh, maybe you have not integrated into your uh, kitten routine yet that I do really recommend. I, I buy toothbrushes in bulk and every litter that I foster gets their own toothbrush. Uh, toothbrushes are great for encouraging grooming. We know that mom cats meticulously clean their young and so we want to uh, encourage our kittens to learn how to groom themselves and a toothbrush is a great way to do that warm baby wipes, toothbrushes, um, those can really uh, encourage a kitten to start grooming on their own. But not just uh, for their comfort, but also for keeping them clean. We want to have these kittens know that we're going to keep them clean. Uh, I would say that probably one of the main things I see in foster homes is that our kittens are just not um, as clean when they're orphans. We have got to do a good job of cleaning them. So after they eat, after they go to the bathroom, gently wipe them down on their face, their paws, their butt, their belly with a warm wet cloth or baby wipe. You don't want to let formula stick to the mouth and face um, and you don't want to leave any urine residue behind. Um, these kittens can really become very sensitive with their skin and they can lose fur. Um, and have a lot of irritation. So um, keep your babies clean. Uh, I know a lot of people are, are scared to wash a kitten, but it's something that you really can do. These are some of the supplies I use for keeping my kittens clean. Um, you can use, uh, you know, obviously your baby wipes and your, your toothbrush, but I really like using a, a soft sponge. You can cut it into little pieces and each kitten can have their own little sponge that you can use for spot cleaning. And then you can give kittens a bath. Don't let anyone tell you you can't give a kitten a bath. You don't want to do it for fun, but if a kitten is dirty, um, you know, they that signals to them that nobody's taking care of me and we want them to be comfortable. We want them to be healthy and comfortable and feel safe. So I'm going to um, show you one last video, which is about how to give a kitten a butt bath safely. Uh, and then we'll move on to questions here in a moment. Um, so here's a little video about how there really is no shame in a butt bath. I am reporting live from the kitten bathroom where I am about to give the kittens a bunch of butt baths. Now these guys are orphans and if they had a mom cat, their mom would be meticulously cleaning them. I do the same thing with baby wipes, but sometimes the oopsie poopsies are a little too strong and they have to get a butt bath. I wanna make sure these guys are gonna be warm when they get out of their bath. So the first thing I do is heat up a heat pad and stick it right under a soft baby blanket. That way the baby blanket can get nice and cozy and warm so that when they get out of their bath, they have a warm spot to return to. Come on, Zuma, let's go. Kittens can get cold really easily, so it's important that you get the temperature right. While that's warming up, I'm gonna grab some washcloths. All right, my water's nice and warm, so I plug the sink and I get ready for Zuma's bath. I'm just soaking Zuma's little butt in the water. You never want to dunk more of the kitten than needs to be cleaned because this is a really stressful thing for them. So I just dunk their bottom half in there. Since Zuma's pretty crusty, I'm going to let her soak for about 30 seconds. Now there's a couple different products you can use for this. You can use dish soap, which helps break down oils. Or you can use an unscented baby shampoo. I like to use baby shampoo for these little guys. It's pretty gentle. I try to do this as quickly as possible, but also as thorough as possible because I don't want her to have any poop left behind. Now I am going to rinse her butt with fresh water. I just run some water over her tail, always protecting her face, always protecting her eyes and ears and mouth. Just a little butt bath. And that's it. Then you can dry them off. Kittens don't like being wet, so you want to try to get them dry as fast as possible. The first method for getting her dry is just vigorously rubbing her with a washcloth. Another method you can do is to back comb the kitten using a toothbrush. This just helps aerate the fur and get it dry faster. 
Okay, you little fluff butt, you're all done. Now that your kittens are nice and dry, they can go back to their nice, cozy, warm blanket and get back to a good, comfortable temperature. Good job, baby. Good job. I think my number one thing that I say to kittens is, good job. <laughs> I'm always encouraging my kittens. And you know what? Even if they don't understand the spoken language, they definitely understand tone and they appreciate uh, the comfort, not only of being fed and cleaned and uh, having all of their needs met, but I think they do appreciate um, that nice verbal reassurance that somebody is taking care of them. So don't forget to keep your babies warm after they um, take a bath. Uh, and of course, we're only doing this with babies who are really filthy. Otherwise, we're just going to keep them nice and clean with a baby wipe. Now, I know a lot of people are asking, how do you get started? If you're interested in bottle baby care, what do you um, do? What's the first step? Well, the first step is hop on Google or whatever search engine you use and just look up the name of your city or county that you live in and animal shelter or cat rescue. Um, you can go on the websites of different organizations in your area and find information on fostering. Now, I know a lot of uh, big animal shelters have had huge response, huge outpouring right now of people who are interested in fostering. So um, if you contact them and they say that they don't have a need right now, I would recommend um, definitely reaching out to some of the smaller rescue groups in your area. Um, you know, kittens might be coming into shelters or might be coming into rescue groups. Um, so please don't give up on finding a place that you can foster. I promise you that uh, there is a need, if not today, than tomorrow. Uh, you can follow up by phone. You know, there might be an orientation process. Every organization is going to be different. So do some research on the organizations in your area and uh, contact them and they'll be happy to hear from you. Uh, once you have gone through your orientation process, gather your supplies and you can let the fun begin. Hopefully this is something that you are able to do, not just during this period of social distancing, but um, even beyond. I hope that this is a moment that shows people that, you know, really you do have what it takes to foster. So thank you to everybody who is staying home and fostering. Of course, I could talk forever and ever and ever about kittens, but um, that's why we're going to be doing this over a period of four weeks. So if there's something I didn't cover today, um, I promise you it's probably coming up in one of the following weeks. Uh, today was really focused on just standard care of bottle babies. But like I said, next week we'll take it um, ahead towards those growing kittens. And then after that, we'll be talking about um, you know kittens who have health conditions and kittens who are feral or found outdoors. Um, so there's a lot more to come. The next webinar uh, will be next Saturday, April 25th. So I hope that you guys will join me for that. That one is called Beyond the Bottle, Caring for Growing Kittens. So I do want to just say there's some additional resources available. Uh, my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash kittenlady. I have a lot of videos on there about everything you might need to know about kittens, and I'm always adding more videos. And then also kittenlady.org, you can find a lot of materials there. I will be sending out my Orphan Kittens booklet PDF to everybody who registered for the webinar. Um, it's available in English and also in Spanish. You can access that um, today by email. I'll send that out. And then also on kittenlady.org, you'll be able to find um, information on my book, Tiny But Mighty. Highly recommend that to anybody who's fostering bottle babies um, because it's got a lot of the information we talked about today and more. And it's also available as an audiobook if um, you know reading a book is not your thing. Listening uh, is something that you can do even while you're doing bottle baby care. And uh, my website is kittenlady.org. Lots of information there for foster parents. I also want to just shout out Royal Canin again and say thank you to them for partnering with me on this awesome kitten care webinar series. They have a lot of information about kitten nutrition um, and kitten development on their website as well. So you can also find some great information there. Uh, and thank you to everybody for participating today. These are all the places you can find me. And now I'm going to move on to Q&A. Um, there's still time to ask questions. So if you have a question, you can pop it into the chat. And I'm going to start um, answering some of the questions now that I see coming in. So thank you guys very much. I really could talk all day. I mean, I think I could literally do this all day with you guys talking about kitten care. Um, but let's see what some of these questions are that have come in. 
So um, I talked about this a little, but one question um, is, what do you do if your local humane society is not currently taking foster applications? Where else can you look to foster? Um, so that is uh, a really interesting situation we found ourselves in here. I think a lot of people in animal welfare, myself included, are um, surprised and delighted by how many people want to foster right now. Um, and that means some humane societies, not all, but some of them have had um, a really large number of uh, foster signups and they may not be accepting applications, um, any additional applications at this time. But I don't want that to discourage you from uh, signing up with another organization. So look up rescue groups. A great way to play, uh, find rescue groups is to go on PetFinder. If you go on PetFinder.com um, and search your area, you'll see all of the rescue groups that are operating in your uh, county, in your city. Um, and you can contact them because rescues are still going to be pulling um, kittens out of shelters right now. Uh, so they will definitely be happy to hear from you. There's a question about the best sterilizing products. Um, how do you sterilize? Um, and obviously, I will be definitely addressing that in the third webinar, which is called Keeping Kittens Healthy. Um, sterilizing is a major part of kitten care because, you know, like I said, when we, these, these kittens come in, they have uh, potentially unknown health history. They could be carrying um, anything. And we want to keep everything sterilized for their protection and also for um, the protection of your animals and any other animals who come into the home after. Um, so I use a disinfectant. Um, there's lots of different disinfectants on the market. The one that I use is called Rescue Disinfectant. Um, I really like that one because it's designed for use um, in animal shelters and animal rescues. Uh, you can buy it as a concentrate. You can get a big bottle of it and um, you just dilute it down according to the instructions on the bottle and it lasts a long time um, and it it does great. Um, so that's what I use. But there's uh, a lot of information that I'll be covering in my third webinar, which is May 2nd. And that, that webinar will cover kind of the specifics of disinfecting different things in your home, whether it's like a tabletop or a soft... Uh, stuffed animal, something like that. There's different things that you need. Um, so the next question, let's see. Um, I'm fostering a mom cat and babies. The mom takes care of all but one baby. What do you do? Do you bottle feed the one or will mom come around? So that is definitely um, why I would recommend anyone who's fostering moms and babies still needs to know about orphan kitten care. Um, because when you're fostering a mom and babies, uh, you are uh, definitely going to be monitoring every single step of the way and making sure that they really are all eating um, and, and having the care that they need. So even with mom and babies, we're weighing our kittens daily. We're making sure they're meeting their mark. And if they're not, then they may need supplemental feeding. Um, so don't assume mom is feeding the babies. You have to still monitor them. Um, with that one baby that she's not feeding, I would definitely recommend supplemental feeding. And I did see another question here um, that was from somebody else asking a similar question. Um, where is it? Let's see. What would you recommend um, for a baby? It was the same kind of situation. Um, a baby who's the smallest of four. He has three sisters to fight for food. They're three weeks old, and the one kitten is very tiny. I worry about his size. When can I introduce wet kitten food? So um, those kittens that you're talking about specifically are three weeks old, definitely too young to introduce wet kitten food. And I, I want to say I know we're always tempted to just say, well, what if we can just get them to eat on their own? Um, but that can really seriously backfire. When you prematurely wean a kitten and give them um, meat when they are too young to really uh, be able to absorb those nutrients, uh, they can really have bad outcomes. Uh, they can lose weight. They can have very bad diarrhea. They can fail to absorb um, the nutrients from the food. And, um, you know, they can also have difficulty even consuming the food because they're not yet coordinated enough and they don't have the right 
um, just biological development to be able to consume and um, digest the food. So I would not recommend feeding that kitten um, wet food. I would recommend supplemental feeding with a formula. Um, so anytime that you have a mom and babies and you're not sure one is getting enough food, supplemental bottle feeding is always an option. Um, even if you do it twice a day, that's better than nothing. Um, okay, let's see. A lot of mom and baby questions, which is awesome. I love that there's so many people who are fostering moms and babies right now. Um, can you address the needs of having a mom to adopt um, other kittens into her litter? Okay, so I think this person is asking, um, can you have like a surrogate mom? And that's a really interesting one. So, um, you know, when you have a kitten who is motherless, who is an orphan, uh, you might ask, well, can I just introduce them to a lactating cat? And that cat can take the kitten in. Um, there are definitely some risks associated with that. Uh, the first risk would be, of course, that the mom uh, rejects the kitten or is not happy with having another kitten uh, brought in. So um, that can be that can be a safety issue there. Um, that's not always the case. Some moms will definitely take on a surrogate, um, and so that can that can work. But the big safety hazard is just that these kittens can carry illness, and so you have to know anytime you take a kitten who you just got in, who's a bottle baby, they're not going to, um, you're not going to have a health history on this kitten because they're brand new to the world. So when you introduce that kitten to any other animal, whether that's a mom cat or uh, another foster kitten or other babies that that mom is, is um, nursing, then you are potentially exposing everyone to disease. Um, I know that might seem like a low risk if you've never uh, encountered that before, but Take it from me. I've been doing this a long time. For me, it is not worth that risk. Um, I have seen way too much, and you don't want to have to go through the heartache of um, introducing a kitten to other kittens and then all of them get sick because that one kitten was carrying an illness. Um, that being said, there are situations where that might be a suitable situation. Um, I think a lot of animal welfare is kind of understanding uh, that we're all working with different resources, we're all working with different scenarios, and so being able to um, adjust based on our specific situation is very important. So if you're in a situation where there is no access to formula, there's nobody who can bottle feed, the kitten is risking death otherwise, you know, in that situation, then yes, maybe you would introduce the kitten to a surrogate mom. But really, um, if you're in a if you're in a situation where there's the option of providing them bottle feeding, that is what I would recommend, um, just for the safety and protection of all. Okay, got a lot of questions coming in. Thank you guys so much for all of your participation today. Um, let's see. Nighttime is uh, difficult for kitten care. Do you have any tips? Um, yeah, I do. I actually have a video that I almost included in this talk, but of course I talk way too much, so I, I actually cut it out. Um, but I do have a video on my YouTube channel um, that is all about uh, advice for people caring for kittens overnight. I think it's just called Overnight Care for Kittens. And, um, you know, yeah, it is true that you have to take care of baby kittens overnight. And that can be a lot for somebody who's new to it. Uh, I have a couple pieces of advice. The first is, um, you know, know that when your alarm goes off, uh, you're going to want to help them because you know that you're the only you're the only option they have for food. So you know you're a compassionate person. You're a foster parent. You're gonna want to get up. Um, there's a lot you can do to prep for that. So um, you know before nighttime, I would recommend making enough formula so that. You can just go ahead and have it ready to go. Um, you don't have to do a whole song and dance. You know, everything is prepped. Uh, you just feed them, help them go to the bathroom, um, you know, clean them up, have everything right there. Some people even will keep their kittens in their bedroom um, so that they just have to, you know, ooh, wake up, <laughs> feed the kitten. Um, 
But, uh, you know, I would recommend just having everything as prepared as possible. Uh, and then the other thing is if you do live with somebody else who can do some of the care, um, that was not the case for me for the first many, many years that I was fostering, but, um, I'm very fortunate now to have, um, my partner, Andrew, who also loves kittens. And, uh, so we will do a little bit of, um, staggering our sleep schedules when we have very, very small kittens, which just gives each of us a little bit more opportunity to sleep. So for instance, he's more of a nighttime person than I am, so um, I'll encourage him to stay up and play video games. I'll say, you know, you should stay up and play video games, and while you're at it, you should do the midnight feeding, <laughs> so that way I can go to sleep. Um, he does the midnight feeding, and then he goes to sleep, and then I, you know, I do the next one, but by that point, I've had many hours of sleep, um, so that can be a nice way to do it as well, but um, know that it's only a few minutes every few hours. It's really not... Um, it's not as bad as it might sound, and you really don't know what it's like until you do it. So uh, I recommend watching my video for some more tips. Um, you know, my number one thing is as soon as your alarm goes off, put your feet on the ground. Just put your feet on the ground, because once your feet are on the ground, you're going to stand up and you're going to go feed them. So alarm, feet on the ground, go feed the kitten. Um, but a lot more tips in that video. Okay. I'm worried if I do a mom and babies that the mom cats won't be adopted. What happens to moms that aren't adopted? Can you give any tips? Um, well, I would say uh, that I would not be super concerned about that because um, there's really no evidence that mom cats uh, don't get adopted. It definitely is easy to find a home for an eight week old kitten a little bit easier than finding a home for an adult cat. Um, but what I would say is there's a couple things. One, um, you can adopt her out as a bonded pair with one of her babies. That is an option. Um, adopting a mom and a baby is, is a really magical thing. And I, I do that sometimes with my moms and babies is send them, um, with a kitten. So the person gets an adult cat and they get a little kitten. Um, but also really just sharing their story, like sharing the mom's journey. People love an animal that has a story. Um, and you always want it to be an uplifting story. You don't want to just tell a sob story. You want to tell that story of hope and show how, you know, this mom has, uh, been so, uh, compassionate and sweet with her babies. And, uh, you know, one thing about mom cats is they tend to be, and not always, but they tend to be very, very sweet, uh, when they're going through, uh, caring for their babies. And so you can get some great videos of them just being lovey dovey and let people know who the mom is. I mean, adult cats deserve and, um, do get homes, uh, just like kittens do. So, um, I wouldn't be super concerned about that. Um, just tell their story, um, you know, maybe adopt them out with a baby, but don't worry about that. Mom cats rock. They're so fun to take care of. Okay, do a couple more questions. Some of the questions I'm seeing are things that I will be addressing later on. So I see a lot of questions like, um, how do I give a flea bath to a kitten? We're going to cover that in um, week three. So please do register um, and attend those later sessions. Um, that week three, I think, is going to be a really big one for people because there's so many questions about um, health health issues and kittens. And uh, we're going to cover all of that on May 2nd. Um, but let's see what other ones we have that are relevant to today. What do you do if your kitten aspirates while feeding? That's a great question. So um, that can happen. The first thing to know is if a kitten aspirates, the way that you'll know typically is you're bottle feeding the kitten and all of a sudden you might see them go like, <laughs> or you might see a little bit of formula come out of their nose. If you see that, stop what you're doing immediately. Stop what you're doing. And then what I do is I will take the kitten. I should have brought a little stuffed animal in here as a sample, but um, take the kitten and I will actually turn them slightly upside down on like a, a angle like this and I will tap their back gently. You're not like hitting them aggressively, but tap their back and you're going to encourage anything that did go up into their respiratory system to come out. We want to get all of that out. We don't want them to be inhaling formula. You're also going to um, listen 
and see if you're hearing any funny respiratory sounds. Does that kitten sound um, like they're wheezing or like there's some kind of weird noise when they're breathing? If that's the case, um, then we want to talk to a veterinarian. Definitely you want to talk to a veterinarian because if a kitten does really aspirate badly, then they may need um, support from a veterinarian who might recommend an antibiotic or something like that. Um, but aspiration is definitely serious. So if it happens, it might just be a little bit. You turn them slightly angled downward, tap, 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 tap their nose with a tissue, make sure that you're getting any formula away from them. Um, but the best thing to do, of course, is to, to avoid aspiration. And the way we're going to do that is by feeding them in a proper posture, you know, monitoring, making sure they really are swallowing, not feeding, not squeezing the bottle and all of that. Okay. How many times a day do you stimulate your baby kitten? So you stimulate your baby kitten at every feeding. So that chart that I showed, um, where you're seeing the, uh, the feeding chart, which I will also send out as a supplemental material today, um, that is your routine schedule. So it's not just when you feed. Every time that you feed, you stimulate before you feed them. Once they're like three to four weeks old, they may start going to the bathroom on their own. I'm going to be talking about litter training in the next session. Um, so you'll learn all about that next week if you attend that one. Um, but uh, yeah, that happens every single time. So Every time that you do your routine, you help them go potty, you feed them, you clean them up, and then you put them right back. Okay. All right. I'm going to take just a few more questions and then we'll close it up for today. I'm so enjoying hanging out with you guys, though. I could do this all day. Um, let's see. When do my kittens get to eat wet cat food? They are 16 days old right now. Well, first of all, thank you for helping those little babies. 16 days, I know you are doing feedings around the clock and you're super eager to get those kittens uh, onto wet food, but really, really, I recommend waiting until they have um, those teeth coming in on the side of the mouth. Um, and we'll talk all about weaning next week. That's like a huge portion of what we're going to talk about next weekend, April 25th. Um, but the important thing to know is if you prematurely wean a kitten, you're not going to have a good outcome. You really want that kitten to be ready to consume meat. Um, so your kittens are 16 days old. I would say you have, you know, you have a couple weeks to go, um, but keep looking in their mouths. They're going to get, like I showed those cute little incisors, then they're going to get their canines and then they're going to get their premolars on the side. Once those premolars come in, then that's a time that you can go, you know what, I'm going to start giving you little bites of wet canned kitten food. Um, and you know, Every kitten weans differently. We're going to talk all about that next week because literally every single kitten, you're going to have a different experience with weaning. Um, so it's important to know what to look out for. Um, but the good news is uh, for this person, your kittens are 16 days old. You will get that information before they are actually weaning age. All right. Why don't I take one or two more questions? Um, uh, let's see. So many great questions that I'm going to be addressing later on. Um, questions like, what do I do if I find a kitten outside? How do I know if she's truly orphaned? We're going to talk about that May 9th. I know that that's really far away. So I'll give the quick and dirty answer is um, if a kitten's outside, very likely that mom is around the corner. But the way that you would know if they are truly orphaned, I mean, one is by monitoring, but two is if they look like they are clean and plump, like a little plump potato uh, and they're super clean and quiet, those kittens probably have recently been cared for by someone and it's probably their mom. So um, those kittens are probably not orphaned. Whereas if you find a kitten who looks very sick or dirty, or they are crying out, um, they look very thin, those are kittens who um, are more likely to be orphaned. We'll talk a lot about that in weeks three and four. Um, 
Any extra tips for caring for solo kittens? Yeah, I love caring for my little solo babies because you just end up bonding with them so much. Um, I think my biggest tips for solo kittens is just really helping them know that they're not alone. So giving them, um, you know, access to a stuffed animal, maybe even a stuffed animal that has a little heartbeat inside of it. You can get um, snuggle kitties. The snuggle kitty has a heartbeat that, um, you know, you just put two AA, AA, AAA batteries, I think, into and um, you turn it on and that kitten has the comfort of a heartbeat. Um, those kittens I'm definitely toothbrushing. And uh, the cool thing is once the kitten has been with you for a few weeks, if you have another litter of kittens or another solo kitten, you can introduce them. You just don't introduce them right away. And we'll talk about that also in uh, the coming weeks. But in general, yeah, you uh, would not introduce two solo babies right away because one of them can be carrying an illness that they can give to the other one. So we want to keep them separate. Um, but I would recommend if you have a solo baby, maybe get another solo baby and don't keep them together for the first couple weeks. Um, I will do that. If I get a solo baby, I'll tell the shelter, hey, I have a solo one week old. I'm looking for another solo one week old and I'll raise them until they're three weeks old separate. And then at three weeks, I will introduce them to each other and they can become best friends. Um, kittens definitely benefit from having a friend. Um, so I would recommend, you know, in any case that you can do that safely um, to do that. All right, let's do maybe one last one. Oh, this is a great question. So this person works at a bank and their manager is considering letting them bring the kittens to work and take short breaks to feed as needed. I just want to know if I can safely transfer the teeny tinies from their tub set up at my home into a soft carrier to take them with me to work. So yes, you absolutely can. And I love that question. Um, I, when I first started taking care of bottle babies, I worked in the school system in Philadelphia and I would take them to work with me and I was able to do it very discreetly. I think a lot of people, um, you know, they're, they're scared that kittens are going to be a big distraction in the workplace. But when you're talking about bottle babies, these guys are like little jelly beans in a bag that sleep 23 hours a day. So um, they're actually not a nuisance at all in the workplace. You can bring them in a soft carrier, put them underneath your desk. Uh, people don't even have to know that they're there. And then every couple hours, instead of taking a coffee break or you know scrolling on Instagram and looking at cat photos, uh, instead of doing that, you do something else with your couple of minutes. You you know warm up a bottle give that to them, help them go potty, clean them up. Uh, but that is a wonderful thing. I love that your boss is um, wanting to enable you to do that. And yes, it's absolutely safe. Um, kittens, they don't know where they are. As long as their care remains constant, uh, it doesn't matter where they are. You can totally take them with you um, in a car. You can take them with you uh, to work, to a friend's house. Obviously right now, most of us are not moving around too much, but um, under normal conditions, you can take a kitten with you just about anywhere. The important thing is that their environment stays the same, meaning they still have a heat pad, they still have a soft blanket, they still have their cuddle companion, um, they're still safely contained, and they still have all the same care that they need. So I think that's a great place to stop for today. I want to thank everybody for participating. I want to thank Royal Canaan for partnering with me on this. And please do uh, come to the next webinars. Uh, next week's is going to be really fun. We're going to be talking about um, things like weaning, litter training, um, you know, how do you help a kitten develop appropriate behaviors. And I'm even going to be talking about um, how to find a home for your kittens, uh, everything from marketing your kittens to how to know if a home is the right fit for your kitten. Um, so please do attend that. If you're doing bottle babies, then you know your bottle babies will grow up and you'll need to have those um, additional skills for that second wave of kittenhood. Uh, so I hope to see all of you next week. That'll be April 25th at 11 o'clock. 
uh, Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, right here, wherever you're watching it, you can watch that. And of course, you can go to kittenlady.org slash webinar to register so you'll get all the additional information um, and materials that we'll be sending along. But thank you all so very much for joining me today, and I hope to see you next week. Bye, guys.